Hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for being so patient and waiting. I want to thank everybody for being here. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Thank you for being here again and your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Before I get started, I just wanted to, uh, a couple of house rules, you know, of course, respect my guests, um, Miriam, uh, respect people in the chat. We can agree to disagree in various things. Um, we're really here just to understand Miriam's story, okay? And the different things that have been happening in the last couple of months, okay? So I'm gonna remove myself and I'm gonna bring Miriam up so we can get started, okay? Oh, sorry. Did you want me to go straight to reading this? Go text? ahead. <laughs> oh gosh, sorry. You're we fine. Talk yeah, I'm super, super nervous. Okay, so you just want me to... Go ahead. It's all yours. Okay. Everybody, uh, Everyone's listening. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, I am super, super nervous. Um, it's unfortunate that I've had to... Uh, I guess that I am suffering the indignity of having to um, provide a lot of personal information. And um, that is a little bit scary for me, to be honest. So um, yeah, what I've, what I've done is I've prepared a statement ahead of time because I'm nervous that I'm not going to remember all the things that I want to tell you, um, the things that are important to me. And so I made... Um, yeah, I wrote some things up to share with you. Um, I hope you'll bear with me. It will take me some minutes to rattle through that. Okay. I have pursued my criminal case against my father for the past 12 years. In March of last year, I conducted a two and a half hour recorded phone call with the perpetrator, a person who I wished to never speak to again in my life. And yet I somehow found the strength to pick up the phone and ask him about the things he did to me when I was a child. I have pursued this alone. I have persisted through what seemed impossible. I never gave up. For many years, I have understood that the sexual abuse of me was known and covered up by Scientology, but I didn't know the depths of it. I didn't know the details of how it was done. Now I understand that the cover-up was by design at all levels of the organization from the bottom to the top. Apart from bringing LAPD to the Aftermath show set and sitting in the room with me while I gave my statement to police officers, Leah Remini nor Mike Rinder have ever offered me any assistance, nor have I asked for it. Until recently. I am thankful for Leah Remini for being a badass troublemaker, for daring to ask questions. I am grateful that I got the opportunity to share my story on season two, episode one of Leah Remini, Scientology and the Aftermath. The reach and impact that this show has had has been incredible. It is unfortunate that in the episode that I appeared in, a misrepresentation was created in the editing of two separate statements that I made about two completely different things. They were mashed together while a reenactment of a child in pajamas appeared on the screen. They did this because I refused to go into the details of description of sexual abuse acts perpetrated against me and the producer pressured me while the entire crew watched from behind the cameras. until I gave them something. You have to give the details, she said to me over and over. The public needs to know. Finally, I gave in and I said, okay, I'll tell you one detail. <laughs> the inaccuracy that was inserted, sorry, I'm gonna say that again. The inaccuracy that was inserted into my story through the editing process minimizes the actual and very real harm that I experienced which spanned across two countries and occurred over a time period of at least four years. Miriam, we're here. Okay. It's okay. Take Sorry. your time, girl. You got this. Look, you got a lot of love and support here. Just take your time, okay? It's going to be okay. I've got it. I've got it. The details of what happened to me are captured in my police statement. Let me say that again. 
The details of what happened to me are captured in my police statements, the first of which I provided to Australian police in 2012, five years before the recording of the Aftermath show. The evidence supporting my allegations are, one, a recorded phone call which took place between myself and the perpetrator in March 2023, and two, a video recorded interview conducted by law enforcement with the perpetrator on the 20th of November, 2023, in which he made several admissions detailing the sexual ab abuse of me beginning in 1988. Detailed descriptions of the abuse by him have been either offered up, admitted to, or, or are uncontested by the perpetrator. On the 4th of January, 2024, LAPD submitted their report to the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office and is, occur and is sorry, let me say that again. On the 4th of January, 2024, LAPD submitted their report to the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office and is currently awaiting a decision to prosecute. Leading up to the aftermath show, Rinder kept saying that my story is the, is the one, I'm gonna say that again, guys, sorry, I apologize. Okay. Leading up to the aftermath show, Rinder kept saying that my story is the one that could bring down Scientology. In fact, he convinced production that my story was so valuable that it justified the co it justified the cost of my airfare from Australia, which they were hesitant to pay for. He said to them, "If there is one story you need to cover, it's hers." Why was he so adamant about the value, credibility, and accuracy of my story? A child sexual assault claim can only affect the reputation of an organization if they were themselves involved, covered it up, or knew about the cover-up of the crime. Why did Mike Rinder believe this to be true in relation to my case? Perhaps this will shed some light on that. Matt Pesh, a board member of the Aftermath Foundation, described in a YouTube video about a slush fund that he was required to keep to cover up crimes of a sexual nature. In an email to the mother of a child rape victim, the details of which she posted in a comment on Mike Rinder's blog, Matt Pesh describes the OSA, that OSA covered up this instance of child rape in Florida in 1996, and that he, Matt Pesh, transferred funds to move the victim and the perpetrator across state lines to get them out of the jurisdiction of where the crime was committed. Matt Pesh wrote, the OSA drill for this sort of thing goes something like this. One, convince both parties that they are responsible and grossly out ethics. They have put the church at risk and they need to withhold what happened for the great good. Cover up anything that might not be good PR for the church. Two, get both parties immediately out of the state, in this case, Florida. Three, follow up to keep the flap secret and or make it go away. There aren't any Hubbard documents that exist, which explicitly detail step by step how to cover up crimes of a sexual nature. If they existed, we would have heard of them. So this detailed step by step procedure had to have been created by someone else. Matt Pesh said it's an OSA drill. Who created, directed, or authorized this OSA drill? Could it have been the person who was the head of OSA for 25 years, Mike Rinder? The perpetrator in my case was moved to England in 1998 after the crimes against me were made known by him during an interrogation in 2001, when I was 16 years old, I wrote a letter to David Miscavige via the Religious Technology Center letterbox demanding consequences for the perpetrator for what he had done to me. And soon after that, I was moved to England as well. Does this now sound familiar? In fact, the perpetrator received an order from his senior official to get me over there and make sure I liked being there. I have no problem with people whistleblowing, but should they be put on any foundation purporting to help victims of the type of crimes that they themselves covered up? Could that be considered a conflict of interest? Any organization, person or group should be assessed for the harm that they do as well as the good. I retain my right to ask questions and to speak freely about the personal harm that I have experienced. 
Every time that Mike Rinder announces to the world that he destroyed people's lives, he is met with praise and applause. Is Mike Rinder so upset that he can't be questioned? Or do I not have the rank to ask that question? People need to stop looking at this through the lens of an anti-Scientology movement. Oh, but gosh, what will this do to the cause? Anytime a person states that, they're at the risk of damaging their own credibility. If you believe that a crime only matters if a Scientologist committed it, and that the crimes of an anti-Scientologist should be absolved, then you are no better than the people who covered up for Danny Masterson. <laughs> yeah. I need to breathe a little bit, okay? Um, <laughs> I need a tissue and I didn't even bring any here. But do you yeah. want to go get some tissue? Let's just have no, it's, a... It's all right. Okay. I've the tears. Um, all right. I just wanted to say thank, thank you uh, for everyone who listened to that. Um, okay. I'm, I'm okay now that I've gotten... I think we can... I can like relax now and I can just... Okay. Yeah, pay attention to what you're asking me and we can go from there. Thank you. Um, I want to be very clear about something because why don't we just... Let me start with... with theme a, a theme of a comment that i've been noticing throughout the first video that i did and throughout everyone else's something to the effect of um this is just drama why are you guys doing drama like you all sptv needs to work together whether you're right. in or have been what what is your response to people that say this is just drama everybody needs to get along what is your response to that i have zero interest in drama I don't participate in it. What I'm interested in crimes, specifically the crimes that were committed against me as a child and the cover up of the sexual abuse that I experienced, period. Let's start from that episode, okay? I did, I was able to get a little snippet, okay? And I'm gonna pull it up here. And for those that have watched, uh, this, this was season two, Hold up. Let me see if I can reset it real quick. This was season two, episode one. And you were there along with another woman. Okay. Yes. And my understanding is that, let's see, here we go. This really details. And, and it's something that even Mike says, you know, he brought in your mother. He, as far as his involvement with your family, let me go ahead and play a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. She was very talented. And when I was about three, four years old, she then relocated to Los Angeles to complete a series of oil paintings, which were portraits of Elron Hubbard, and which she was recruited through the Sea Org to do. That was your mother, correct? Yes. That yeah. they're referencing. And these are her paintings. And these are the paintings that she did. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm the one that brought the mother to Los Angeles. Yeah. I had no idea she even had children. Yeah. Like, do you want to have some? Do you have something to say about that specifically? Because, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. At the time, I was struck by the way he announced that. Um, I mean, for me, it's devastating. He removed my mother from me for years, okay? And during that time, I endured sexual abuse, okay? He took away my mother's protection of me. Um, and what I would say is that he states there, I didn't even know she had children. Well, that's an impossibility. Like, I grew up in the C organization, in the organization that my mother was in with Mike Rinder, in which he transferred her from Australia to um, Los Angeles. And I know that you create a life history and you detail every single connection, every single relationship that you have. It would be detailed in there and it would be detailed in those personal personnel files that he would have had access to. And she would have required specific approvals before they could move her, before they could provide the funds for her flight. So the fact that he's saying, oh, we, I didn't know she had children, it's just a falsehood. It's a lie. Okay, let me keep playing. Yeah. You would give up, Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't have. That was my point. Yeah. There's you wouldn't have. Exactly. So then Leah says, like, yes, you would but... give a fuck, Mike. Yeah. And then he says, I wouldn't have. So yeah. to me, that says, yeah, even if she did, it 
wouldn't matter. They needed an artist. That's what they needed. No yeah. concern Point about and children family. and family. It's this is a sealed member. There is a sealed member who's an accomplished artist. She's needed here because we have to do this book. Right. My mother was um, an amazing oil painter. Okay, so let me just say in regards to that, my mother has described to me that she was working for the Office of Special Affairs. And in fact, I have, I now, through evidence in my police case, have access to her passport records. But I also have anecdotal conversations that I had with her where she told me that she traveled to the US from Sydney when I was very young. And um, while she was doing work for the Office of Special Affairs, while she was doing, um, she was involved in an anti-psychiatry campaign and she was typing up legal documents, okay? That's the conversations that, sh that I've had with her. And when I see the passport evidence um, that details her exits out of Australia, I can see that on the 3rd of March, 19, oh, sorry, that I'm um, jumping ahead here, but um, I can see that in 1984 and in 1986, she made those trips. And, um, and then later in 1988 is where she then finally went. Um, and I was separated from her for a period of about a couple of years. When people say, and I'm gonna share this part because in that same episode, that's a very interesting scene. I think it's at the 34 minute mark that says Miriam's mother signed an affidavit 20 days before the airing of this episode, which, uh, she said that she didn't learn of Miriam's abuse until 1998, and that's when she did she divorce, and when she did that she divorced Miriam's father. So, right. those people that are saying, "Well, why is this an issue now, Miriam? Why didn't you talk right. about this Good when question. you when you met uh, Mike Rinder back or or Leah back in 2017 when you aired the episode? Like, oh, why okay. now? So when I <laughs> First of all, the filming of the episode took place months, at least three months before it aired. Uh, and I was not, and it says in there, 21 days before the airing of this episode, I was not aware of an affidavit. I had never been told about an affidavit. And yet in, in the show, it's recorded me saying that I asked my mother for a statement. I said, it's the only thing I ever asked of her in my entire life. That's okay, right. So it should be known that that was so important to me. And then when I saw this for the first time, I was sitting in my living room watching the initial, the first airing of this show, right? And I, I mean, my jaw fell open. Where is this affidavit? Why haven't I been sent it? I sent an email to production as a result, and I asked for the affidavit. They said, I'll check with the legal team. They checked with the legal team and came back and said, um, sorry, and I and I should say specifically, I asked for the documents related because there's two things in the show. There's another thing about a statement that Scientology made, also admitting to knowledge of the sexual abuse of me. So th this is evidence in my case. Can I have it? And the and, and so production checked with legal, and then came back to me and said, um, no, you cannot have it because of confidentiality arrangements. Um, and listen, like. I, I was a lot more naive then than I am now um, in terms of, like, I didn't know that I could fight harder for that. Um, yeah. And I didn't have the backing of law enforcement at that time. Um, LAPD, you know, I'd put a report into LAPD and they did nothing for years. So, so this I is two yeah. specific criminal cases so that we're clear we have one in in. Right in Sydney right. and then we have one in LA, right? Right. So in 20, if I'm understanding this correctly, in 2017, mm -hmm. you, you, in that same episode, you see Leah and Mike sitting with LAPD, production can't record, you're there, right. everything seems right. to be fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, so okay, here so we let me just, right, ahead, so let me explain that. So my first police report was to Australian police in 2012, okay. because you're required to report to your local police department um, I did that first to my um, local police department, and then it was forwarded to the location of the cr the crimes, which was St. Mary's, New South Wales. Um, and then we built the case from there. Um, that case then um, went to a judgment, a decision of whether it would be prosecuted within Australia. And the decision was no, because the perpetrator resides in the U.S., it should be sent to the U.S. authorities. So then I, I was just waiting. I was following up and following up. I, they, um, Australian police couldn't give me any contact details. So I was really kind of at this like this kind of loss of like, 
there wasn't anything else I can do. Now, I, I really do give Leah Remini credit here, where in 2017, when I flew over to Los Angeles to film for the show, she asked me, hey, do you want, you know, do you want to report to LAPD? Like, how about I bring LAPD in and you can report here? Because it was fortunate that just um, the end of 2016, the statute of limitations for California had been lifted. So, you know, what a blessing that that, that kind of fell into place because um, I didn't know that I could report to LAPD. And so Leah really gave me that opportunity. Um, and, you know, so I, so I really do want to give her credit in that. Um, so she did, she, you know, LAPD arrived to the set. We went into a closed room and I gave my police statement to LAPD. And that was 2017. Gotcha. Okay. So here we are present time, 2023. Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened. What, what what happened exactly that made you try? Like, what is that you needed? What happened? Where okay. where we're at at this point? Why are we here today? Okay, okay. So a couple of months. Uh, sorry, let's go back to I think it was August, just off the top of my head of last year, where the police investigator in my case, in the Australian police case, emailed Mike Rinder and asked him for this affidavit. So where I was saying before is like I didn't I didn't know I had like I didn't know I could push on that. Um, and so so with law enforcement asking for the affidavit now, like there was a chance. I thought, oh, I, we could get this document. And um, the responses from there and let's say like really, okay, let's just say some very unsatisfactory responses over the, like the, then the next few months. Um, where I, my concern level increased just, okay. yeah, over time. Um, okay. So that was seeking the affidavit. Um, I, I, I still to this day haven't had a clear, clear answer on where the affidavit is. Um, I'm, I'm still interested in that. If anyone knows where that is, um, I can produce that for me, but, um, at this stage, and, and what I was told is that um, it was likely lost by production or the legal team, which seems quite a strange, just seems a very strange circumstance for actual evidence in a child, you know, sexual abuse case. So, yeah. So the way I understand it, and I was able to see some of this communication because you shared it with me, was, um, you know, reached out to Mike, Mike, hey, um, Here's the the investigator, the criminal investigator CC'd on this email. Uh, could we get the original episode, which was provided right. to the investigator? He was given a link. It, he was able to download it. The investigator replies to you and Mike on this email and basically mm -hmm. says, listen, the affidavit at the 34 minute mark, the same one that we just showed here. He says, I want to see it. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. see it. Can we get a copy of it? And that yeah. essentially initiates, um, I, I guess, some conversation where Mike's like, I'm going to get back to the, you know, I got to talk to the production company to try to see, you know, it's possible that they got rid of it uh, mm -hmm. because they keep documents. But yet this was a pretty, I mean, talking about Scientology, it's a very litigious organization, right? So how you would get rid of documents like that is, I, I don't understand. But this is right. essentially Let me answer what his that. response was. Go ahead. Well, his his answer to my question of that was that after 12 months of not being sued, so between 2017 to 2018 from the airing of the show, production not being sued, they would have likely gotten rid of the documents. Okay. Um, which, okay, so let me just hit on here the significance of an affidavit. It is literal court admissible evidence and again let me emphasize i stated in my episode that i had tried to get a statement from my mother and here is a statement that is legal like <laughs> like it just okay so you guys get the point um now so what i would sorry and i've lost my train of thought can you please you're fine you about yes um yeah so you were saying explain so the reason why you needed yeah. this affidavit at this point not only is it being requested by the investigator, you have this recording right. of the perpetrator. Uh, it could assist in criminal conviction at this point. 
Okay, right. So um, let me just say there. So it was in March 2023 that I did the recorded phone call with the perpetrator that mm -hmm. went for two and a half hours. Okay. And that is police evidence, right? Um, and then following on from there, um, yeah, it was. It was like, okay, so, you know, what are the next things we are going to do? There was um, about six months of preparation for the police interview. So there was a lot of work that had to be done. You're talking about three different jurisdictions, okay? Australia, um, Los Angeles, and the location where he currently resides. So mm -hmm. law enforcement across three jurisdictions had to, um, you know, figure this out and plan it out and, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so when the... Um, when the affidavit was asked for by the police investigator, um, the interview with the perpetrator had not yet occurred. Gotcha. That did not occur until the 20th of November, 2023. Gotcha. Okay. So just to be clear on that now, now the affidavit is, is like, because now there, there is a full confession and admissions by, um, particularly in the Australian case by the perpetrator, um, it's this affidavit is is not the thing that is going to um, it's still evidence in my case, but it's not, you know, we have detailed descriptions by the perpetrator recorded of what he did to me. So that that I mean, yeah. OK, so just to, so you understand the kind of hierarchy of the evidence right here. Definitely. But for me, but for me, it was important. And that's why I pursued with Mike Rinder and I continued to email him and follow up with him. Okay. So then we get to December where, right. So that's now um, he's, he's, he's looking for it. He's contacting legal. Look, he is, he's, he's saying that he's trying to help me and I appreciate that. Okay. But I was becoming increasingly concerned mm -hmm. um, that, you know, things kind of weren't, like, and I, and I already had, my, my questions were building for Mike Rinder. So I thought, well, what the heck? Why don't I just ask him some questions? And look, he did agree to that. He said, okay. And I said, look, if you want to, we can do that in a phone conversation. And he, um, and he agreed and, and we scheduled a time and we spoke. Um, it was via WhatsApp and um, it was two phone calls. And that took place in early January. It was in like the first week of January. Um, in that conversation, I asked him the questions that I had that were regarding details of the how how the crimes against me would have been covered up in Scientology. And again, look, he was very forthcoming with that. He described and he he answered a lot of my questions and he had described um, the functions of the organi organization, how the information would have come about, how it would have been handled, who would have been sent to. What I heard him say throughout that conversation is he kept saying the Office of Special Affairs International. I just like, I he, he was giving me a lot of names. He gave me lawyer names that um, possibly could have been involved. And um, again, I appreciate that information. But when I'm hearing constantly the Office of Special Affairs International, and I'm speaking to the guy who was the head of Office of Special Affairs International, I don't, you know, I start to feel a bit uneasy. One of the things that he said was that, this was towards the beginning of the conversation. He said, look, Miriam, I was doing the Lisa McPherson case from 1996 to 2001. So I don't know anything about this stuff, but here I, but I can detail to you what, what might have been or what, um, how it may have been handled. So when I hung up the phone from him, I thought about the questions and answers that I had already drawn down. I took very detailed notes. Um, and, you know, I, I thought, OK, so from 1996 to 2001. But then what about um, before that or after that? Mm -hmm. Because like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. OK, so like I'm a child who was born and raised within his organization. Right. That that time slot um, does not does is not the entirety of the the times when it could have been known about. So, um, and in fact, the perpetrator exited the organization in two thousand and four on his own volition. He actually put his hand up and said, "Hey, I don't think I should be here anymore, because uh, <laughs> Miriam's in the outside world now, and at any moment she could 
termian. Um, so this is a risk for Scientology. Okay. When a person leaves the C organization, um, the Office of Special Affairs, Mike Rinder described this to me um, in detail. The Office of Special Affairs uh, receives their files, like so all their files, and um, basically has a look through to see if there's any legal risk to the organization. So should okay. they leave, uh, if they leave, what risk is exposed to the organization um, directly? Okay. Okay, so once that risk is assessed, um, they will, they'll work out what they're going to do. And so oftentimes, um, so if, they, if there's legal matters, then they will engage with lawyers. Uh, Mike Rinder detailed specific lawyer names that might have been involved. And um, yeah, and so then from there, there's binding documents that the person is required to sign before they can leave. Okay, now in 2001, when I left, I was required to sign a binding document in regards to the sexual abuse that I experienced by my father, okay? So my father, the perpetrator, would have also been required to sign binding documents, okay? So who does that? It's the Office of Special Affairs. Um, just so we're clear, okay? <laughs> and Mike Rinder described to me that that the my particular case would have been of the utmost priority of the utmost risk to the organization. When I asked him on a scale of one to 10, where would you place the, the, the level of risk to the organization? And he said 11. So you're saying, so, so now let me ask you. So a, a, like a level 11 risk to the organization. And then if someone can explain to me how the Office of Special Affairs International would not have wanted to be involved in a, a level 11 risk to the organization. And he cited, um, you know, specifically that my mother worked very closely with David Miscavige for many years. Um, he described why my, my particular case would have been, um, yeah, a high priority, high risk. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And so as a result of that phone conversation with Mike Rinder, um, I hung up the phone. I, I let me tell you, I felt quite disturbed. The very next morning, I received an email from him where he asked me if the phone call was recorded. Now, you have the former head of Office of Special Affairs International, okay, who was known for fair gaming and destroying people's lives. Okay. And now he wants to know if I've recorded a phone call and because he is worried that he incriminated himself. Do you understand how terrified I have been for the last few weeks? I want people to understand that. Okay. I want people to fucking understand that. I want to read that part real quick. He says, hi, okay. Miriam. Nice to speak to you yesterday. Did you record the calls we had? I want to note that if so, I would ask that any portion that anyone wants to use as are checked with me first to ensure they're in context and accurately reflects reflect my views. Thanks, Mike. You don't answer. Okay. I right? don't answer because I am now very concerned. Mm -hmm. Two days later, he emails me again and his tone changes it escalates can you read that one let me see so that was january 7th uh january 8th miriam as you have not responded to the email oh, below sorry. let me can i say um just to clarify what what, what you're going to see there's going to be a slight inconsistency inconsistency uh, sorry inconsistency with dates because some of these are will show the u.s date and some of them will show the australian date and i'm yeah. one day ahead okay just so and there's it's a thursday difference. over here you're I friday everyone, it's friday here yeah yeah so i just want so everyone everybody to understand. Knows. yeah so for Thank me you. it was the phone call uh sorry the phone call the email the next day and then two days later a second email okay now understand that when the police investigator first asked him for the affidavit, Mike Rinder responded, it's it's most likely lost kind of to that effect. Um, I have that. Specifically. And then he said, but I'll get back to you. Three months went by and he never got back to the, to the police investigator. 
I had to follow up with him three months later. Okay, so but he wants an answer two days after. Okay, so let's go from there. Uh, January 8th. And again, um, let me let me say something before I continue reading. This is not defamation of anybody's character. These are his words. He wrote this. I just want to make sure everybody understands. Okay. So uh, he writes, Miriam, as you have not responded to the email below, I assume the answer is yes, you did record the calls. The last question you asked bothered me as it was not designed to elicit information about your case, but possible incriminating information about me. After the call, I looked up the information about Dick Hubbard. The reason I knew nothing about him is that I have be I had become L-R-H-P-P-R-O International some months before his activity came to light. As you know, the information is strictly compartmented uh, and I was no longer in OSA. I assume if you did record the calls, it was done under the approval of law enforcement. I doubt that approval extended to wider information gathering for some other purpose. If any of my assumptions are incorrect, please correct me. If you passed on any of the information you got to anyone other than law enforcement, please inform me, inform me who you told. I know there's a campaign ongoing to get me removed from the Board of Child USA. I hope you're not part of that. I didn't even know he was part of that board but go ahead right okay so where do i even begin um well, okay can you so explain you... what dick hubbard and lhr right, go ahead okay so what he's saying there is that um so in the phone conversation he offered up information about two cases one and and presumably they i know one of them was child sexual um battery cases i uh, sorry case against two children um, and that was the perpetrator was named um, Donald Anthony Strawn. OK, but for this one, Dick Hubbard. Now, I was perplexed about this because I, 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 I like scoured the Internet um, and I couldn't find anything in relation to uh, Dick Hubbard or presumably a Richard Hubbard uh, in relation to Scientology. I did find a perpetrator that was convicted in California. Um, but yeah, I couldn't find any link there. Now, it's interesting. So then my question is, who is this Dick Hubbard? I have no idea. Um, and, and, and my grinder is saying, well, I didn't know anything about that because I was part of the LRH PPRO. And basically what that means is like it's a pub public relations position, quite an esteemed uh, elite position in the organization. And their sole duty is to um, create good public relations um, about Hubbard. OK. Um, and so, you know, promote his good works and, you know, create a good name for him and, and all that sort of thing. But someone by the name of Dick Hubbard and 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 what that and that's the reason why you're saying that it couldn't have fallen into your purview. Um, is Dick Hubbard a relation to Alron Hubbard? I don't know. I just have more questions about it. Yeah. So, um, so <laughs> believe me, I scoured the internet. I couldn't find anything that linked this Dick Hubbard to um, Scientology. And that had me perplexed for quite a while um, until I then went back to my detailed notes of which I have kept record of, okay? Okay. Um, where he mentions another case, uh, this Donald Anthony Strawn case. Um, now, what I noticed what he was doing is he was making these blanket statements as in, um, I didn't know anything about your case because I was working on the Lisa McPherson trial from 1996 to 2001. I okay. didn't know anything about Dick Hubbard, the case about Dick Hubbard, because I was the LRH PPRO. And, you know, and I mean, th there's the favorite, the famous line or, or I don't know if he said this directly, I'll be clear about that, but I've certainly heard it. And the belief is certainly perpetrated uh, that uh, um, from 2004 to 2007, he didn't know anything about anything because he was in the hole. Okay. But when, but let me just add to that to say that I've seen the recent OSA documents that have been released and they detail I mean, what's included in there is orders that he made, directives, programs he created. Um, they, they're they from 2004 to 2007. He was very much in command of the Office of Special Affairs International from 2004 to 2007. What I'm getting at 
Okay, so let's go back to the Dick Hubbard thing. That's all I know about that one. Um, so I noticed that sort of behavior of like where he's blocking out these time periods. So then it would seem as though he didn't know anything. He mentioned there, as you know, everything is so compartmentalized. No, I don't know that. In fact, what I do know is that reports would often go to several people and those people would talk amongst themselves. And usually the organization, like within the organization, things were really well known. And anyone who was in that environment will tell you the exact same thing. They will not say that things were incredibly compartmentalized. That is not true. Okay. So did I answer everything on that one? I think you did <laughs> and some. Um, okay. he then emails you back. You don't, you don't respond to him. There's no emails anymore between the 8th to the 15th. He sends you another email January 15th. And he says, Miriam, I finally got the information from the lawyer. And I'm assuming that's pertaining to the affidavit, right? Correct. He says, however, unless you respond to my questions below, I do not feel comfortable providing you with further information or assistance. It seems simple enough for you to answer, but apparently you don't feel the need to afford me that courtesy. Now you think you have nothing to gain from me. I spoke to, is it Kyle's replacement? Kyle's the officer about okay, the phone so let me calls. Sorry, let me just say there. Kyle, the officer in charge of my case, he was away on leave at this time okay. that my leader had sent an email to him and he got an automated reply that said, um, Kyle is away. Please contact such and such. And so Mike Rinder was contacting the police in relation to my case. Like, yeah. uh, please understand. Like, do you know what that fucking did to me? Like, you guys have to understand what I was living through in the weeks that these emails were coming through to me. Okay. Yeah. And I did not engage. You know, I, you know, it's just like the, because I was fucking terrified. Okay. Please, yeah. I want people to understand that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, he says, I spoke to Kyle's replacement about the phone calls and we'll follow up with him this week. I'm trying to give you every benefit of the doubt and hope there's an explanation for what appears to be an underhanded illegal scheme that is ironically exactly what people claim I did when I was in OSA 30 years. Looking forward to hearing from you. Okay. So I believe he says when I was in OSA 30 years ago. 30 years ago. I'm that? sorry. Yes. Right. I couldn't okay. finish the email because it cut off. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So interesting. Okay. So let's look at that. Now, um, what is, what is interesting is that what that made me, there's two things in there. Okay. First of all, that people claim he did. No, he has said that he ha was involved. Um, or at least he says the office of special affairs was involved. Um, the association is implied. I think, um, he's been very clear. I mean, anyone can search any video that Mike Rinder has done. Okay. So it's not that people claim. Let's let's be clear on that. Well, let's he also did a video that. with Leah talking about how OSA covers up crimes. Right. So I would I my thought process is that you would be the subject matter expert of that topic if you're having those conversations and you have mm -hmm. documents and you've detailed certain things that somebody like me wouldn't know, right? Or or even you to a certain degree because you're not in that department mm. of Scientology. Yeah. Okay. What was the other part of that? Um, the, what it made me think about, sorry, if you could just read that again, just the last, that last paragraph, sorry, because it, it, it sent me on in a little investigation. You're fine. It's oh, the years ago. Okay. What people, exactly what people claim I did 30 years ago. Okay. 30 years ago. Um, well, what happened 30 years ago? What year was that? Was it 1994? Is 1994 yeah. 30 years ago? Okay. I would say so. Let's do some math. Donald <laughs> Anthony Strawn committed his offenses against two children, age 11 and 13, in 1994. Okay. The mother of the victims in her testimony in court stated that the Office of Special Affairs prevented her from reporting to the authorities. She said the Office of Special Affairs, okay? Yeah. 
Right. So anyone can search that on the internet, please. And please do. And please, like any of these things that I'm saying, look for them, screenshot them, download them before they disappear. Okay. Right. Um, so can't... am I clear on that? So 30 yes. years ago, when I say let... Donald Anthony Strawn, sorry. Yeah. You let go. me show them. Let me show them mm -hmm. okay. what you're talking about. This is one of the right. documents in reference. Go. I work with the Church of Scientology's legal office. It's called the Office of Special Affairs. So the Church of Scientology recommended that I not that recommended I that I not turn him in. Okay. Now let's be clear here. She she's she wants people to know. She said it three times. Yes. It's called the Office of Special Affairs or OSA. O S A. Please. Like she wanted it to be clear on the record. The mother of two children that were harmed by Donald Anthony Strawn. Now, this case, this is um, in the uh, this is in the state of Florida, um, Pinellas County. Okay, and and um, he was convicted in 1995, and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Okay, Donald Anthony Strawn. Anyone can look that up. You can um, the the testimony by the mother is uh, on the internet. OK, mm -hmm. I'm not making this up. If it's definite, if it's defamation, then that means that it would be false. I'm not saying false things. Let me be clear. This is not defamation because it is true. OK. Right. So when he said 30 years, 30 years ago, exactly what people claim I did 30 years ago involved in an illegal scheme, I, I thought, what? why is he so specific 30 years ago? Like, I mean, he's, he's pointing to something. And that was when I went back to my detailed notes of which I have record of where he twice tells me about this case involving a person named Tony Strawn, who he described as having been on the Apollo and whose mother was a celebrity Scientologist. OK, and that he was a Scientologist um, around flag in Clearwater flag, the big base. I think everyone knows about what that is by now. Mm -hmm. OK, now let's go back to the phone conversation where he described to me why my case was important to the Office of Special Affairs International. He flagged certain things. OK, um, my mother's uh, interactions with Dave Miscavige over the many years. OK, so. If you understand that, you understand that things get prioritized by risk and priority, okay? Um, so, yeah, explain to me why the Donald Anthony, like he was telling me in the conversation why this case was important. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So I think I've been clear on that and we can probably move forward. Absolutely. So how, let, me, let me stop real quick because it's a lot, but how are yeah. you feeling? Like, how, do, how are you feeling? You get these emails and you're just like, what do I do? This is a lot of like a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. You're needing support. Right. You okay. reach out for support. Tell me. Where do we go from here? What happens next? OK, so I want to just go back a sec to go back to this um, video police interview with the perpetrator. And the reason why that's important is because I got a phone call and it, I believe it was the 1st of December last year, the 1st of December last year, right? Um, the police investigator in my case, Kyle, called me and I just pulled in the, into the driveway. I was about to start work, about to start my day after dropping the kids off at school. And he called me and he said, look, I need you to know that the police this this invest uh, this sorry this interview this in person police video interview that we've been waiting for for months so that's occurred now um it took place on the 20th of november i have been provided with all the details um i've been provided with the, the recording and i need you to know that he described things in detail of what he did to you okay and he dated it so to 1988 is when he said that, that it started. And he said, I need for you to hear the details that he described in the video recorded interview. He went on to, to describe um, horrific details that I did not know because I was three years old and I do not remember them. Okay. I struggled to like to survive the next couple of days. I like I I was just functioning. Okay. I was 
trying to keep myself inside my own body. I was so like I the 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 information that he told me, I couldn't I just like I just it was um incredibly incredibly upsetting. Um at at that point I realized okay, I I need help. Um what I what I first did is um over a period of about a month I really focused on trying to um just mitigate my own nervous system. And I tried to do that by making sure I slept well and, you know, um, looking after myself. I was, you know, just like, yeah, really trying to take good care of myself just mm-hmm. to get through each day and just to survive. Right. Um, yeah. you know, I, I've got a busy life. I have a full-time job. I run a business. I have two children, um, and, and I'm a single mother. So, um, you know, and, and those are the things I just try to focus on those things. Like, okay, try and look after myself, try and look after my children, try and look after the business that I'm running. Um, okay. and, and I'll admit that there were many, many hours that I sat in front of my computer screen when I should have been working and I just stared into space many hours because, once I dropped my kids off at school for the day, um, I just kind of switched off because I was able to do enough to look after them. Okay. Yeah. So I struggled for a month. And then after that month, I then called Claire Headley and I said to her, Hey, look, I've heard that the Aftermath Foundation, you know, is, is, um, is not just helping people that are like just leaving Scientology, that in fact they're helping people with recovery and that sort of thing. And look, I I think that I I really, really believe that I need um, some help with the post-traumatic stress um, that I've been experiencing. And I began to cry and I explained to her that, I explained to her about the police, um, the details from the police interview. Mm -hmm. And she said, Sorry, I didn't start crying yet, but I did. I, I did. Uh, I, so I asked her that. I said, "Is that something you know? Post traumatic stress um, support is that something that you guys can do?" I specified the treatment that I was wanting to do, and she said, "Look, yeah, yeah she gave really positive feedback about it. She didn't, you know, shut it down or anything like that. She said, yeah, put your application in.' Like, you know, and at that point, I started crying with relief. I was like, "Wow, I could, I could." I could get some serious relief from what I've been absolutely struggling with on my own. Yeah. Um, so from there, I, um, I wait, I put my application within 24 hours after that phone conversation. And, and then I waited. Uh, meanwhile, um, the things, the dates correlate that the, the interactions with Mike Rinder were escalating over a period of some weeks. Right. Um, and I was still waiting for an answer from the Aftermath Foundation with this treatment. And so then I began to, and by the way, I, I want to add in there that I had already included Claire Headley in the interactions uh, that I was having with myself and Mike Rinder to to hopefully ask for someone to intervene on my behalf. I thought if she was aware of it, I mean, they're really close friends. Maybe she could say, hey, like, Mike, like, maybe don't do that. Um, and, and well, maybe, yeah. So I don't know if that conversation ever took place, but, um, were you including her in the emails or just giving her a phone call and letting her know about everything that was going on? Um, I had, I had forwarded her an email and just off the top of my head, I think it's the email where he's escalating, um, with like the, it's becoming kind of threatening and right. And so, and that he's withholding evidence in my case, um, and um, and then I did follow up with her in phone calls saying like, oh, hey, so you got my application? Like, hey, what's happening with it? Like, and she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's only one person in front of you and then yours will be reviewed. And um, but then at one stage, she just stopped responding to me. Um, wow. And so I just became again, like my, my concerns were just increasing and increasing. I mean, I'm going through post-traumatic stress in a very real visceral way. Okay. And I I play the devil's advocate real quick here. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Let me just stop you. And I hear you, but I'm kind of wondering too, because I also hear the other side saying, well, you're asking for help from the organization, which the man that is supposed to help you, right. Is there, did it ever occur to you to like Mm -hmm. think, well, is it really a good idea for me to reach out to this foundation? 
Like, would that be a good idea? I'm I'm curious. It's, you know, a, it's a really great question. No, I had a lot of belief in the Aftermath Foundation. I had a lot of trust in the Aftermath Foundation. I mean, I had only, um, I think it was like a month or so before that, had done a video with Claire Headley. Um, she was very familiar with my story. And yeah. in fact, she had been, um, just prior to this, towards the end of December, she had messaged me couple times saying oh hey when are we going to do part two i'd love to do part two of your story like when can we do it and i was like oh um you know like it's holidays busy da 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 so um i'll get back to you and okay so then that's that look i i had full trust in the aftermath foundation that they were that they didn't have conflicts of interest and maybe that was really naive of me but i just didn't have i mean until sometimes until you you ask for something you don't know. Like, I, I can't say, I, right. I just didn't know before I knew. And when I knew, um, yeah, it was. It, it wouldn't be your job to call that out. Let me just be very clear. But I'm kind of wondering of that side too, like how maybe even, like who calls out the ethics and that in my opinion, it would have been the person in charge. Now, in, in no way, and let me be very clear, in no way mm -hmm. am I trying to drag the foundation. Uh, people have made this about the foundation when mm -hmm. which we're going to get to these questions the questions yeah. were to mike rinder not the aftermath Correct. foundation not the headleys Correct. i know they wrote like a three-page dissertation in their community post and you know bless them this isn't about them mm -hmm. in actuality to a certain degree you know this is your interaction that you've had however in reality this is about what you've said so far and kind of where we're at you know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. i just wanted to make that clear and I hope that yeah. That yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's yeah. I think I've said what I need to say on that. Yeah. Are you ready to talk about these questions? We should. I think we've covered enough of a foundation. Um, OK, yeah. so OK, so we'll, let's let's preface that by saying, I mean, I think people can understand where my concern level was at, at that stage where an organization that I thought was you know, didn't have a conflict of interest, like it, it, things were changing. And, and like, I was coming across more and more information because the more that, um, listen, I was also experiencing nightmares that Mike Rinder was going to come and try and harm me, that he was going to try and fair game me, that he was going to send a private investigator after me. Like I was living in a nightmare. And so that I was like, this is this is how I cope with my stress is that I need information. I've done that PTSD. with my police case. Yeah. Okay. So that that's how I get. So so what I was doing was I was researching Mike Rinder for the last uh, few weeks. And the more I was coming across, I was like, it was horrifying. And then to yeah. see the way the Aftermath Foundation was behaving with me, when I've asked them for help specifically and specifically I was having communications with Claire Headley. She was aware of, you know, some of what was going on. She knew my story. Like I, I just, I, I, for me, I was like, okay, I need to bring this to public awareness because I don't want any other victim to be in the position that I'm in and experience the things that I've experienced. Like, and yeah. so that's when I started um, trying to reach out to you now, the reason I wanted to do it on your channel specifically is that, I mean, I am I obviously have connections within the SPTV community. I mean, I'm involved in a channel myself called Children of Scientology. Um, I mean, I could have yeah. done it anywhere there, right? Um, and by the way, I don't have a relationship with Aaron Smith Levin. Um, so I didn't even want to do it on his channel. And he has a huge um, base, fan base or whatever, subscribers or whatever the hell you want to call it. I did one live with him kind of recently, but that was after months of like invitations and um, the people that I was working with were wanting to do it. And I kept saying, nope, nope, nope. Like Aaron Smith Levin and I had a falling out, a public falling out in 2017. And we weren't even friends to begin with. We didn't even know each other, but I, we'd been put into this Facebook, this massive Facebook group um, after directly after our episode, um, sorry, our show had aired season two. So a bunch of us season two people came into this thing that was already like this fan base thing for season one. And Aaron mm -hmm. Smith Levin was just swinging his dick around all over the place. And I didn't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally guys. 
<laughs> not literally, but like I was um, not expecting that. Erin, did you if you watch this? <laughs> um, no, because like okay. um, Reese, I love Reese. She's so incredibly beautiful and hilarious and amazing and incredibly intelligent. Um, and she she refers to dick swingers. And I just want to make it known, like <gasps> I thought Aaron <laughs> Smith Levin was just. Like I didn't think highly of him. I um, and actually the interactions that I had with him at that particular time, I was like, hey, "You're a fucking asshole." And so there are many people that could produce screenshots right now of negative things that I've said to them in private chats or in email. Yeah. Um, it, it's no secret, okay. And on that. Well, what's your that relationship did, now? Are you guys okay now? I mean, it's it like water under the um, bridge at this point. Right. No, I'll get to that in a sec. So it, even yeah. in that live, by the way, um, that was facilitated by the third person that was in that conversation. And um, and before and after that live, I didn't speak to Aaron. In fact, the other person in that conversation contacted me after and she's like, you were supposed to stick around. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know. I just <laughs> left the Gotcha. Anyways. Okay, so so that's the context there. Look, I reached out to you, um, what was it like a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, okay, I need to get this. Yeah. I need to, it, this needs to be talked about in a public forum um, that's not within the SPTV community. And I liked your style, how you would kind of pull things apart. And I felt like I could really go into detail um, like we're doing today. Um, now, I first reached out to you an email, and I mean, you'll say this yourself, you didn't respond to me. And uh, I, it was like, after about a week or so, I can't remember how long, I was just like, oh, how do I how do I get to her? And then, then I started contacting people that had been on your show. And um, in fact, yeah, and so, yeah, I, that's I how contacted we three contact. people. Right. And so that's when I, I like got because I listen I don't have personal uh contact with Aaron but I was able to get through to him like look I want to speak to Rabbit so this is very very recent I just want people to understand that I don't have a relationship or a friendship or this isn't uh, yeah okay there you go I think I've been mm -hmm. clear um where was I getting to okay so then when you and I started to plan and I had told you what I wanted to get into and you realized the serious nature of what I was going to come in with you then said to me like, okay, well, do you have questions for, how about we put some questions together for Mike Rinder? We give him the right of reply. I mean, it's the responsible thing to do. Yeah. And I was on board. I was like, okay, right. And I, I for over like a few days, I really thought about my questions. I initially wrote some down and then I sort of added to it and I finalized them and you sent them. Um, and then yeah. the result, right. And you emailed that to Mike Rinder directly. Yeah. Uh, these are not, to be very clear, these are not my questions. We're going to go into the questions now, but yeah. these are not my questions. But one of the things that I told people that, you know, and this was just thinking out loud is I'm very solution focused. Um, and if there was a way, like the way I see it, if there was a way for there no live to be, like if we didn't have to do a live and we were able to get documents or more cooperation, that would be awesome. I don't like mm -hmm. railroading people. So the way I saw this is it would not be fair to have Miriam come on and not actually have, you know, questions that Mike Rinder can answer. Or if, if, if Mike Rinder wants to, not that he needs me the flea or the dog, whichever one I am, uh, but... <laughs> I mean, he could do so, you know, he has enough celebrity of himself to do so. But the way yeah. I see it is like, people are giving you the courtesy of that. Let me show that email. Okay. Okay. And oop, let's see, this went to a different screen. So this is an email. Um, let me zoom in a little bit more. I have my screen behind over here. Said, Hello, Mike. And notice the email is to Mike Rinder, not the Aftermath Foundation, not the Headleys. It is to Mike Rinder on his Hushmail email. I said, uh, my name is Alex the Rabbit. I run the YouTube channel Down the Rabbit Hole News. A couple of weeks ago, a woman by the name of Miriam Francis reached out to me for support. Miriam would like to expose her recent experience with you in the failed attempts to get the affidavit and paperwork for the criminal case against her father. I'm reaching out to you before a discussion occurs on my public platform. I hope to provide an opportunity for you to make a statement or an interview regarding Miriam's concerns. Miriam has the following questions that she hopes to get answered from you. Written by Miriam. Okay. Miriam, did I write these questions? Let me know. Can you? No, no. Okay. And so um, I would like to read them myself. 
Please do. Um, and let me just say at the outset, you will see this very, very clearly that these are written by me <laughs> and that they were in relation to at least the first few um, or there, at least there's a few in there that it's very clear that it's directly in relation to my experiences, like my personal experiences. So anyone that read that and knew my story would have known where this was coming from. Okay. Absolutely. Go ahead. So what I would like to do is um, because I would like to um, wrap this up kind of soon. I want to just read the questions in full and and maybe I can come back another time if people have particular questions like, well, why yes. did you ask that in that way? I don't feel the need to justify that. I feel like I've laid out enough foundation, but if people Absolutely. want more clarification, then I'm happy to do that at a later Absolutely. date. Okay. Cause I'm going to need a little bit of rest. I didn't sleep much last night, guys. Okay. So give me a break. All right. Um, okay. So the first one, one, why did you feel it was okay to threaten and attempt and attempt to intimidate me? Okay. Let me read that again. One, why did you feel it was okay to threaten and, uh, and attempt to intimidate me? <laughs> okay. Two, if you didn't commit any crimes, how could a record of our conversation be incriminating for you? Three, why did you lie to me and say that you had uh, had obtained the information that I needed related to evidence for my case in an attempt to use that as leverage against me? Four, you have given a statement in the Baxter case stating your direct involvement in legal issues at Flag in Clearwater. The mother of Tony Strawn's victim said in her testimony that Osa had told her not to go to authorities following the sexual battery offenses that he committed against her two children in 1994. What involvement did you have in dissuading the mother of Tony Strawn's victims not to go to authorities? Five. Did you know that it's a crime in the state of Florida where you reside to tamper with a witness, which includes harassment, intimidation, and interfering with a victim? Six. Most people get their Aftermath Foundation ap applications approved in one to two days. I applied for funds for post-traumatic stress relief, and it's been four weeks and no answer. Is that a result of your personal retaliation against me? Seven. It is interesting that in relation to two separate locations that came under your purview at those particular times, both mothers of children who were sexually abused by Scientologists voiced the same thing, that they were not told sorry, that they were told not to report to authorities or else there would be consequences with the Sykes. Does the scare tactic, which correlates disclosure of se child sexual abuse with a threat regarding psychiatrists, stem from our and Hubbard doctrine? If so, please specify. Or was this by your design under your direction as head of OSA International? Eight, according to the information that I have, in 1985, you were directly involved with CCHR Australia. That's the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, by the way. Did you coach Jan Eastgate on how to coach Carmen Rayner to lie to authorities about the sexual abuse of her by her father? Um, now, I want to just say one thing on that particular one. Um, Carmen Rayner's case and the allegations that Jan Eastgate had coached her in 1985 made international, worldwide headlines mm -hmm. in 2011 and 2012. This is a huge case in terms of the Scientology crimes against children. And I've, I've searched Mike Rinder's blog for Carmen Rayner's name, and it's not mentioned in there. I just want to say that. Um, okay, so that's my question. Did you coach Jan Eastgate on how to coach Carmen Rayner to lie to authorities about this about the sexual abuse of her by her stepfather? I, I also just want to say there, um, and this is probably easily, I mean, I have documents about this, but you could probably Google it, the link between CCHR uh, and OSA. So CCHR Australia was... Um, came under the management of the Office of Special Affairs, just so everyone knows. Okay, I think I'm being clear on that. 
-hmm. From 1997 to 2004, what involvement did you have in the cover-up of the sexual abuse I experienced as a child? 10. During the time that you were head of the Office of Special Affairs, you received daily reports regarding any legal issues. Having reviewed the recently released OSA documents, it has become clear the absolute minute details of staff information that you were exposed to. There is no doubt in my mind that you would have become aware of the sexual abuse of me by my father, which you described to me as being of the highest priority and interest of OSA International. In covering up this crime, are you aware that you participated in a felony? 11. In your YouTube video titled, How Scientology Covers Up Crimes, you present excerpts from two Scientology documents, one from the HCO Manual of Justice and the other from a policy called Attacks on Scientology. Please find a screenshot attached. Would you agree that the way that you have treated me in recent weeks is in line with what is detailed in those documents? Should we read that just quickly? Yes. Uh, or and this or is, could we just post it up and people can see it? Yeah. Yeah. And that is the screenshot, this one right here. Oh. Correct? Yeah. So just a couple, I mean, this is what they had highlighted. This is literally a screenshot from this show. Uh, yeah. It says, if you're being investigated, sit tight. Don't cooperate. Don't ever tamely submit to an investigation of us. Make it rough, rough on attackers all the way. Um, and, and maybe we can post that and people can read it in full. And we'll go to the yes, next and it's available on of that video still, right? Um, for those, there's probably people that have seen it already. But yes, correct. Let me go up a little bit. Hold okay. Up. There's also another here. video on there. I think it was um right around the same time. Um, I think it was before or after this one, maybe. Um, also along these lines, how Scientology covers up crimes, but specifically in relation to documents. Um, yes, there's a particular document there. Um, that they're describing um, and it's in relation to the James Barber case or uh, James okay. Barber um, crimes allegations um, against a child of 15. Um, that's a lot of information there. I would point to people to listen after you after you've watched this, find that video and watch it and yeah. try not to be horrified. OK, try not to experience the horror that I have been through for the last two months. OK, right. Right. Number 12. You work directly with lawyers like Lori Bartleson, as exampled in the attached document, to ensure that the children receive the least amount of education and work the most amount of hours. Your positions as head of the Office of Special Affairs and on the board of directors for the Church of Scientology International implicates you as a former child trafficker. And yet you have never been held accountable for the human rights violations that you committed for over 25 years. You were one of the major gatekeepers between the eye of the government and the children. Therefore, your actions prevented any intervention by governments for the welfare of the children. Have you personally done anything for restitution for these children whose, child, whose childhoods you stole and whose harm you participated in? And if we can bring that document up. Yep, uh, 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 let me see, I think I have it here. Here we go. I'm just going to um, just briefly, and again, please read this in full. Um, okay, so first of all, I would, say that this is a document um it's a office of special affairs document um and i will we'll, i'll point to something specifically in a minute but it's also that it includes a memo from a scientology lawyer, lawyer that i mentioned laurie bartleson um, and it's basically what it details is this um interaction between the scientology lawyer the office of special affairs in trying to obscure um uh what's going on with the children in the way that they are trying to work out Okay, how do we maximize, as I said in the question, how do we maximize the amount of hours that the children can work um, legally? And how do we give them the least amount of education? Okay, um, so yes. I don't want to read this part of it. Okay, it says, there was a recent shore flap with the US government over the schedules that some minors on staff keep. A minor is someone under the age of 18. Whereas, as a church, we are arguably exempt from the federal and state labor laws. Laws regarding the employment of minors are broader. 
federal officials consider that they have a right and responsibility for the minors. And if they receive a complaint regarding the treatment of minors, they are quick to investigate. It is necessary with this issue to lay out for all the laws regarding the employment of minors. Okay. Um, if we okay. could just scroll down to the to just the next page, because I want to point to a couple of things. We'll keep going mm -hmm. now. Let me know when so to stop. Mandatory education requirement and then employment of minors. Okay, we can keep scrolling. Everyone can read this in full later. Let's. I want to go down to see who. Let's see some signatures. I think it's maybe on the last page. Is it? Yeah, okay. it, I'm pretty page. sure it is. Okay. Oh, last page. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's stop there for. Let's pause there for a minute. Just pause there. Yep. Okay. Just just come down a little bit more. Oh well, that's actually that's a good view. Okay. So this is approved by. Who is it approved by? CEO OSA International. Okay. Should we, I mean, okay. And then we have here, we have MR just below in this second page, top of the second page. These, right these, here. Uh, these it says initials. CSI. Right. These are initials, mm -hmm. guys, right there. MR right. would be Mike Rinder. Who are the other initials? Uh, off the top of my head, I Do don't you know. know. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm sure other people would be able to find what that is. Uh, okay. So instead of actually having a signature, they would put initials as their signatures? Um, well, because, see, it's kind of like at the end there, it's approved by. And then mm -hmm. they would have, I don't know. I mean, all I can say is what's on the document. But this right. is the official. It's like um, official Church of Scientology International, all rights reserved. I mean, it's, it's an official board of directors document. Uh, that's what that's saying. Okay. Absolutely. You want to go back to the questions or is there something Let's go else back to the part? questions. Now that's that's it for me. And as I said, pe people can have a look at that in full. Please read it in full. Like I, that's what I'm saying. I'm not just saying wild things, okay? So there's reasons why I have enough information that allows me to ask these questions. Okay. Okay. Um, where are we? Okay, we did that one. Or okay. 13. 13. Yeah. 13. If OSA International committed all the crimes and you were the head of OSA International for nearly 25 years, is it reasonable to assume that you committed crimes? 14. Evidence through passport records and video interview with the perpetrator show that the crimes against me began directly after you removed my mother and transferred her to another country when I was just three years old. Do you feel any responsibility in removing my mother's protection of me while I endured sexual abuse for years? Let me be clear. Evidence through passport records and the video interview with the perpetrator show that the crimes against me began directly after you removed my mother and transferred her to another country. I have the right to ask these questions of Mike Rinder. Okay. 15. Okay. Are you certain that it is appropriate for, sorry, let me start that again. 15. Are you certain that it is appropriate for you to hold a position on any board which concerns itself with the protection or recovery for children from abuse? Mm -hmm. 16. Is it true that Leah Remini, an actor, has the power to exonerate you of all your crimes? But the children whose lives you destroyed are not allowed to hold you accountable. There we go. And then I put as a <laughs> these are questions that Miriam would like answered. Again, if you have a statement or a comment that you would like to make via this email or video, I will gladly share it. Yeah. I want to ask one question and this is not to try to make you justify because i know the essence of what's going on with you right and i know half of the people here understand it but there are a few people that say if i was mike rinder i wouldn't answer these questions because they're very accusatory that's okay y'all are in your right to feel that but i want you to understand i'm not and somebody else said in the comments you should have helped her write those questions rabbit no the mm -hmm. worst thing you can do out of a survivor or a victim is try to take their words and copy and paste them yourself. I I am not Miriam. So I, th there's no Miriam essence behind, you know, it wouldn't be right for me to do that. But what is your response to the people that say, 
I wouldn't have answered those questions if I was Mike Rinder because they're very accusatory and insulting. I um listen, that's his right. I, and like, listen, I, I give that to him. And listen, he has the right to remain silent. That's okay. He, if he doesn't want to respond, that's fine. Listen, he could give a response that would make us understand that he's in a predicament. Okay. And I think that, um, that, that, you know, if, if, if that's the, his answer, then that's his answer. If he doesn't want to give an answer, like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not an issue. The, it's the fact I have the right to ask the questions. So, yeah, I guess, I don't know. That's my answer to that. Yeah. And you can't satisfy people. And that's absolutely fine. Completely understand. Mm -hmm. This is why I, what I've assessed based on the tone, I said, well, if he doesn't answer anything, does he just want to give a statement? This is why I offered that um, mm -hmm. as far as that go. And then um, we Robert, get let the, me say this. Let me say yeah, this. Let me say this. On that. Okay. 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 Uh, I mean, like, oh, but how dare, how dare I, mm -hmm. how dare I insult Mike Rinder with my questions, okay? Like, these people need to think about what they're actually asking. Once you know my experience, then you would understand why I'm asking them. Absolutely. And it's not purely to insult him. They are genuine questions, and I think that the public at least has the right to hear my questions of him, and he can choose not to respond. That's fine. Um, but yes, I dare insult Mike Rinder. I mean, come on. I dare insult him. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Say, yes, we do. We dare. Um, yeah. yeah uh, I think for me, the biggest question that I would have for Mike Rinder at this point is, what what's the worry about being recorded? It's my understanding that he's been cooperative with the FBI. Like, right. what is there, you know, what, what's the worry? Um, I can understand yeah. if he feels like he had a conversation with you and maybe he said things out of context and he wants to, you know, figure that out. And that's absolutely fine. But if, you know... And I, and I had the right not to respond to him. Hey, look, Absolutely. he asked me a question and I didn't respond. And and that, you know, that's fine. And he has the right, that right as well. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Are you willing to answer some of the super chat questions and statements? Do you want, or, do you have time? I don't want to, if you have to um, go, you have to go, girl. I don't want right. to. I, I don't, I don't. I do I don't have to go right now. Um, okay. I just, yeah. Okay. Let, I, let, let me say, like, I'll answer a few. Okay. Um, if later on people, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. And then if later okay. on, like, if you want to put together, um, you know, if, if people are asking, like, the same question over and over, then we can put something together where I can we come on here again and answer those questions. Yeah. We are going to come back again. Um, Miriam has, thank you, Miriam. She has agreed. Um, mm -hmm. If there's, and I think it's interesting because we've said so much, it's always good to come back and like debrief of all the things that mm -hmm. were said. And even like the people in the chat, they're able to debrief with us. I love debriefing, especially tough lives, because I think it's it's a good thing. Um, but mm -hmm. those, there's more, uh, like there's a couple of questions, but more statements that people want to make to you. So yeah. I have a couple of things. Sorry, I just have one thing that I want to say. Yes. Um, and that's kind of in relation to the the, the previous question that you asked. But of here's what I want to say. Before anyone decides to put in the comments and say that because someone is anti-Scientology, that they should get a free pass. Um what they should do, what I would advise them to do, is, and, and what I'm referring to is this Scientology, anti-Scientology, and seeing through those things through those lens, lens, and like, but but he's a champion for anti-Scientology. Well, how could you insult him or question him? Like, um, listen, before you put a comment in there like that, I want you to pick up the phone. I want you to call either your children or your grandchildren, mm -hmm. and I want you to explain to them why you think that someone who is an anti-Scientology hero should not be um, questioned. Like, I, I just want, I, like, have that conversation with your own children, then come into the comment section and put that down. Explain that to your children first. 
That's what Absolutely. I want to say about that. Yeah. Miriam, you are awesome. Oh, and, and thank you. And Rabbit, and the one, the last thing I want to say. <laughs> you say it all, girl. Those, Go ahead. Okay. So the result of that was you sent the email with the questions, and then we received the response with this lawyer letter. And, and that's why, like, just so everyone gets the context of that, those questions were sent. That's the lawyer le letter that we received in response from the Aftermath Foundation. And by the way, I want to point out on that letter from the Aftermath Foundation lawyer, it says the Aftermath Foundation in it six times. I, yeah. I counted it and I'm not good at math, but I counted six times that the <laughs> Aftermath Foundation was mentioned. My questions for Mike Rinder were sent to Mike Rinder. Okay. I just want to be clear. So yeah, we'll probably go and we can, yeah, engage with I the chat you. now, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. This is the, the letter. It's all here, guys. Um, you know, and I was thinking about this too, now that I have you up here and, you know, we could probably talk about the letter some other time, but in reality, it's like this. He could have said nothing. He could right. have just ignored it. It would have been fine. He could have, um, shoot, He it could have been just the first three paragraphs and they could have not said the last one. I think mm -hmm. what this showed me is that like, and, and even the interaction afterwards, mm -hmm. the foundation, doesn't need a PR team. They need to be trauma informed. But how mm -hmm. could you be trauma informed if you haven't dealt with your own trauma? Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't necessarily got a good grasp at it. How can you mm -hmm. be trauma informed? Because yeah. if you're if if the association, because a lot of people, I even thought about this. Maybe this is more about Aaron versus you know you and I. Or maybe because I spoke to Erin, I am, you know, she's going to lay with fleas. Somebody's a flea, somebody's a dog. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't necessary. A lot of the what is happening is not necessary at this point. When I, I read that letter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way I, and here's, here's what's problematic, is that the insult that they put in there is so ambiguous. No one knows truly who it's directed at. And it's it's up for... <laughs> It's up for interpretation. I don't think that's a good idea to ever no. do that, especially not to a victim of child sexual assault. Okay. Absolutely. But let me just say that when I read it, I thought they were insulting me. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm now not sure. But at, when I read it, I, th I believed it was a direct insult to me and, and possibly me and you. Um, yeah. Where, like, and so, yeah. And so I was furious. <laughs> I know. I was really angry. Um, we and both also, were. <laughs> and here's I the reality angry. that here's the reality that like I I almost don't even want to process. It's so cold and so brutal and so dark. Um, I kind of stop myself when I start to think about it because I don't want to go down that um, spiral. Okay. But if this is the aftermath foundation letter, does that mean that the whole aftermath foundation board members signed off on it i mean it's that's horrifying to me yeah. and if it was only let's say it was only the president claire headley and mike rinder let's say that would still be extremely devastating for me given the conversations i've had with claire headley over the last like month or so yeah or two months two months if we include the fact that i did my you know my childhood story i, I did it on her youtube channel so um yeah well, i'll say that it's not the way they should have responded that's for sure um and i think that that you know what they got it all figured out so hmm. <laughs> i don't even know uh tinkle said tinkle tit says this is so concerning hearing about claire have you can make have you communicated with amy scoby too no look i've never interacted with amy scoby i don't i don't know her she, but yeah, I um I know Claire because I've had many interactions with her. In fact, she came on. Um, I I did the Lighthouse Project mm -hmm. uh, with a couple of other, um, well, actually a few other people who were, um, you know, children um in Scientology, and um, particularly two women, Victoria Locke and Christy Gordon, and um in that because we were covering, we did twenty episodes of audio recordings. Um, okay. detailing things about the Danny Masterson trial. Um, mm -hmm. 
Okay. So yeah. So in one of the episodes, or actually, and we, I think we broke it down to maybe at least a couple of parts we had, um, anyways, we did a recording with Claire Headley because she was an expert witness in the trial. Okay. Um, and we were covering the Danny Masterson trial in great detail um, and, and offering our own personal, uh, you know, um, stories to support the Jane Doe's. Um, right. Yeah. Who were victims and that. So, and so, mm-hmm. um, so I had, you know, I, I've had communication and I've had interactions with Claire Headley, you know, about really sensitive stuff. So it's like, I don't, I, I mean, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't even want to think about it too hard because like I, the, I can't even. It's yeah, it's, it's hurtful. Yeah. I hear you. Caffeinated mm-hmm. says everyone is responsible for their own actions, no matter how sorry they are. He can absolve himself by turning himself in, mm-hmm. or at least being transparent, more cooperative, potentially. And look, <laughs> Mike Rinder has said many times that he has given a bunch of documents to the FBI. Um, I was watching a video um, this morning while preparing for this, um, where he said it was in 2010 that he okay. handed a bunch of documents over. So, okay, well, so he's been, you know, let's say he's been, uh, that's what he said. I'm going to believe him. He's been forthcoming with the FBI. Okay, that's great. But what has that got to do with me? What the fuck has that got to do with me? Okay, because I still was harmed and I still want answers and I have the right to ask the questions. Absolutely. And and he can choose to answer them or not. That's that's his, you know, he can do Prerogative. That. Okay. Right. Um, Casey Katz says, Miriam, uh, Aaron's foundation will hopefully be up and running soon. You deserve help and truth purple okay and i just want to rabbit sorry before you run ahead. ahead there i want to clarify because i don't want there to be any confusion on the amount of money that i asked for now bear in mind the aftermath foundation um that i was aware of was sitting on two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. i was also okay. told that claire headley was contacting you know um people who were um had been in scientology previously who were children in it um now adults that she had been contacting them like based on facebook posts that they had put up or in the comment section or whatever right, and she was right. like hey hey don't worry i got your back i'm gonna give you some money so she claire hadley was giving people money for things based on their facebook <laughs> interactions okay i put in what? an application yes yeah, it's serious yeah no I'm, I'm not making that up okay um so i want to be really clear on the amount of money because i don't want anyone to think that it was a large sum of money. And I guess that's all relative okay. of what people think is, is um, a good, you know, a large amount of money. Um, and uh, okay, so, so it was in Australian dollars, and I'll convert that in a minute. In Australian dollars, it was seven and a half thousand dollars. In okay. US dollars, I checked the exchange rate the other day, that equates to in US dollars, $4,925. It was for, for therapy. Specific, it was for a specific couple of procedures for post-traumatic stress that I, okay. I asked for, and she seemed open to it. Look, she could have said okay. absolutely not, don't even bother, um, or like, oh, we'll have to look into that. Not sure. She didn't okay. say that. She was like, oh, well, like, yeah, you know, do it. Like, we're open to it. Um, da da da. So okay. that was my understanding. Okay, so so people. I'm gonna move on, on to this one because of time, uh, Miriam. Mm-hmm. Or excuse me, not Miriam. Mike Rinder should have been asked questions like this years ago. Mike Rinder was a victim, but he was also a perpetrator. Mike Rinder could help out other perpetrators in jail. He could testify, strike a deal, long overdue. Thank you, Purple. Um, and then shout out again to Chris, Susan. I want to just say, I just mm-hmm. sorry. I know we were want to wrap it up. I wanted to say um, a comment on that. Mike Rinder w- um, was able to receive a full education um, prior to him joining the C organization uh, at 19 years old. Okay. Um, okay. I was born inside those doors. Yeah. He stole my education from me. Okay. So don't like, I, I get it. I get it. this is l- listen, it's a valid comment. I get it that yeah, he's a victim. I get the story, right. But I want you to understand the differences and the nuances there. 
and also understand that he's interacting as a grown adult. He's interacting with lawyers all the time. He's aware yeah. of what the U.S. government, um, which is where I was. I was in the U.S. He's, he's aware of what the U.S. government um, is interested in, in the welfare of the children and what they're yes. would potentially investigate. And he was figuring out, OK, how do we keep the U.S. government at bay? And um and and working with lawyers so he ac had access to legal counsel which we did not as children okay let me read this and we i am cut on time right now yeah uh first of all miriam we care we care about you secondly if this went to mike rinders personally as said the aftermath foundation pay for his horrendous lawyer letter then they broke the law of the 5013c it's misuse of public funds mm -hmm. um Jen says, of course you dare. You are the victim. We are with you. Nat says, mm -hmm. if you are saying these questions are too harsh, please rewind and watch the beginning of the video until you get it. She deserves answers and justice. Thank you so much for saying that. Yes. Eat More Pizza says, these are some powerful questions. I ab abhor what Mike has done, as well as the support that the Aftermath Foundation has provided to render. Uh, Valentina says, I wish for him to be questioned in a criminal case. And we never ends believe you. So sorry this is happening to you. Sending much love. Lori thank says, you. Rabbit and Miriam, thank you so much for bringing us this very important story. Miriam, I'm so sorry you went through what you did. And now with Miss with MR. The, uh, there is a... Richard Hubbard with Scientology Services oh. completion in 2012, 2013, 2014. Not sure if it's the same guy. Um, I, that that's a really good link. I, I would encourage I would encourage people to look into that a bit more. Um, so okay. the the so the perpetrator that I identified um, records for was in the state of California. So if anyone yes. wants to link that over to this one, this Richard Hubbard, yeah says so police helped yet a known pedophile is free right so let me just say again that um my case is before the district attorney's office in los angeles awaiting decision to prosecute yes and i'm getting the look because i gotta tend to baby bunny culty yeah. talk says here's to the truth everything comes to light 2024 is our year ex cult members much love and support for all the victims miriam thank you rabbit hashtag times up render oof Ooh. Be angry, Miriam. You have a right to be angry. We are here for you. From now on, you have all the support from everyone here. We Thank have you. your back. Thank you so much. Eat, Eat More Pizza says, because of the attorney's letter, the Aftermath Foundation is culpable. Oh, oh my God. See, that's the thing. That letter <laughs> was too much. Blake mm. says, sure, he was working on the case, working to cover up for Scientology, allegedly, along with his implications. Still working on it today, as we can see. We've got, you've got this, Miriam, and we've got you. Thank, thank you, Anna. And then pizza, thank you. Presidents has been set. Rinder is an embarrassment and needs to be removed from the Aftermath Foundation Board. Lord. Miss says, uh, Rinder needs to come clean, own up to his role, if any, and respond to Miriam's questions, honestly. Whether or not he likes the structure or totality of those, I can't even. I need my glasses questions so that she may seek full justice. Anything less is re-victimization. I kind of, I understand what they're saying. Oh, I disagree. Listen, he has the right to remain silent. He, That's I'm true. not forcing him and I will state it again. He does not have to answer these questions, but I have the right to ask them of him. Yeah. And their questions like, sure. Are they uncomfortable? Is there a tone in the questions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But again, those are not my questions and I'm not going to rewrite them for her. Miriam says so much or Miriam, so much love and respect to you. Rabbit, thank you for the excellent reporting. Calm uh, and kind vibe. Thank you. Thank you. Christina says thank you for doing this, Rabbit. And thank you, Miriam. Uh, Steven says, can you subpoena Mike? No. It's a great question. I don't know. I, I'm yeah, sure they can. Okay. No comment. Uh, Miriam says, I admire your strength. You're a strong woman. I'm so sorry. Had to go through this. Uh, how do we support you financially or otherwise? Um, please, guys, I, I work a full time job. I don't need any financial support. Um, OK. However, I would say if I do get sued uh, by Mike Rinder as a result of this. Um, I, yeah, please help me. 
I Please mean, I, yeah. I heard, I heard, say, well, you're going to get a lawsuit. Uh, of what? I'm not making any allegations. These are just, this is just a platform, and Miriam's just reading her questions. So, okay. Mike Render just needs to answer his involvement. The Aftermath Foundation and their crisis manager has a lot of work to do. Much love. Casey says Mike Render is quite afraid of a lot of his crimes will come out. He wants to sit in judgment over Aaron, but Mike's morals card was forfeited a long, a long ago. As head of OSA, he destroyed children, families, SA victims for decades. Uh, we got you. Stay strong. Big hug. Miriam, we stand in front of you on both sides of you and behind you all the way. Thank Sending you. you love and a big hug if you want it. Stay strong. Pa flea dogs. I swear I'm hearing the flea name everywhere. Powerful <laughs> and well stated. Love you. Chico, thank you. Uh, I says, we support and love you both. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Rabbit, thank you for giving her the platform. Make sure you guys hit that like button. Teamaker, jail them all. Cape says, so well said. Thank you. And Miriam, Miriam, we got you. You're surrounded by love here. Thank you for coming out and praying. Pinkle tits, thank you again. Oh, I just don't want to miss. Uh, Miriam, we're all here for you. We loved you and support. And you're supported by all of us. We hold space for you. Never feel nervous about telling the truth. I think I caught up to all of them. I think Thank so. You. People want to do a fundraiser for treatment. I'm sure Mir sit on that, Miriam. Let me know how you feel. Because uh, if I have you back on, you could talk about that. Okay. If that's something that you feel like you need to do. Um, and then this one is the F uh, Aftermath Foundation Board of Trustees has. Uh, conflict of interest with itself. Conflict of interest. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I just I want to, to quickly go. say, yeah, oh, I, go ahead. Quickly I'm sorry. say um, I want to thank everyone for the support. It means the world yeah. to me. And I also really want to um, um, make known the uh, support I've been get, getting in my own community, um, you know, uh, as they've learned about the things that um, have been occurring. And um, I've just, I just have some incredible, incredible uh, advocates in that space. And I just thank you. Thank you for not making me feel alone. It does make it less scary. I appreciate every one of you and you absolutely know who you are. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, Miriam, you are awesome. I just want to say that. And I I'm going to, I'm going to be very honest with you about something. Uh, and Shannon Lee says a crime you committed or complacent with while you are affiliated with are still crimes you're still accountable for um for your conduct even when you deflect defect and whistleblowers right. both i think this was a very scary topic for me to talk about um you were nervous but i was very nervous too in so many ways and i want to thank you for i don't know for reaching out for trusting me with it um we're not done clearly there's still mm -hmm. more to this so i am going to have you back and hopefully we could talk a little bit more I appreciate you so much for everything. And I just want you to know that your voice has ricocheted all over here and people were waiting and people were messaging me and they were waiting. And there's a lot of people that support you truly. Thank Some that don't so even much. know you, but support you. It's just, it's awesome. Okay. Um, what you've done in um, letting me speak on here. Um, is just absolutely incredible. And I really, really do thank you. Um, and that you've had the patience to learn my story and to yeah. understand what I was saying, sure. because I mean, as you guys have seen, it's a lot of information. Um, and yeah, you've really supported me in, um, in, in to come here to provide a space for me, a safe space yes. for me to speak about it. I do really, really appreciate that. Absolutely. Miriam, um, I want to thank you. You guys, make sure you guys are sharing, talking about it. Talk about it with your people. Talk about it in the community. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Miriam, don't leave yet. I'm going to just hit the exit door here for us because I do have to tend to baby bunny. You guys have a wonderful, great rest of your night. Rabbits out, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you so much again. Bye. Shout out to the new members. Shout out to everybody that gifted. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.